Good morning. Welcome to our Youth Sunday service. Before we begin, there are a few announcements to share with you. We will have youth Bible study tonight at 6, followed at 7 by our last youth week officer meeting. Senior Adult Sunday is one week from today. There will be a fishing day, May 6, at George Wilcox Pond. Everyone is invited. Please sign up on the ad Senior Adult Bulletin Board if you're interested. We have Vacation Bible School that is set for June 22nd through 24th. Registration begins May 1st. Now let's prepare our hearts for worship as the youth bells lead us in our prelude. Gracious God, make each of us an instrument of your grace. Weave us into a community showing forth your power and tenderness. Bless us and our differences, and give us courage to stand together. We call on you today to gather us in your love. Lead us to better know you and glorify you 
on each step of the journey of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please stand with me while we sing Oh Happy Day on page 368. Good morning. This year we chose the theme, My Story, because everyone has their own story, and no one's story is alike. So today you'll learn a little more about what my story means. This is the game of life. It relates to your story and mine because, as you can see, all the bumps in the road, and no one's life is perfect, so you have to go through a lot of bumps in your road, and some people's life is harder than others. The cars in this game are the same as you. They all have different blocks in their way, and they have to work through in order to make it to the end of the game, which for us is heaven. The wheel in this game is the same as you taking a chance. You have to trust God to help you make the right choices. Just like the game has instructions, we can use the Bible to help us guide us through our lives. Now let us pray. Dear God, thank you for letting us all be here today. Thank you for allowing us, these wonderful kids, to be here with us as well. Bless us each of their stories, and may you give them guidance as they travel through life. We thank you for blessing us to be able to worship here. In your name we pray, amen. And also, Jesus wanted to, us to share our story and his with others, so you're going to take two pieces of candy, and you're going to keep one and give one to someone that you
thoughts I am have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to scarce can take it in that on that cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my savior God to Shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great thou art! Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this opportunity to lead worship. We thank you for everyone who is here today to worship you. We know you are writing a story with everyone's lives, Please let our life stories be stories of grace, love, and forgiveness. Help us to overcome our struggles in a way that inspires others. Help us to share your story with others. Help us to become what you created us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please stand with me while we sing Pass It On on page 557.
Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that we can always trust in you. You are an abundant God, and out of your great mercy, you have given us so much. We give you this offering today. With it, we worship you and give our whole selves to you. Please now take it and use it for your kingdom and your glory. Amen. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and I'm here starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. His brother, your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. His father set out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, 
Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. Hello, my name is Jace Ward. I'm the son of John and Megan Ward. Today I'll, today I'll be talking about the parable of the lost son, but I'm not gonna put it, I'm gonna put it in a way that we all wish we could relate to. Now say that your family owns a Fortune 500 company and you're the oldest child and you work really hard to make your father happy so he will leave you a large portion of the company. One day at a family dinner, your younger sibling says he wants his inheritance now because he wants to start up his own company. So your father sits there and thinks about it for a minute and he eventually gives in and does it. So your younger brother goes off to exotic islands, acting like a big shot, buying houses everywhere and gambling millions at a time and it's just making you jealous. But you realize that if you just be patient, one day you'll be able to do it yourself. The younger son never put the money down on his company that he plans on starting up. So one day, he's out at dinner, and his car gets declined. The son panics. He's never ran out of money before. So he tries to dine and dash, but the police catch him at the door. The news finally gets back to you and your father. You're over there laughing so hard you can't even breathe. But your father, leaves work immediately and goes off to bail your brother out of jail. But not only does your brother, does your father get him out of jail, but he also pays off all of his maxed out credit cards and buys him a new Bentley when they get home. The father also gave him a new job with an equal title as yours. Now, you're thinking your dad must have lost his mind and you are as mad as you've ever been. You're wondering, why does my brother get to go off and waste millions of dollars and get arrested then comes home and gets treated like it's Christmas and there's nothing and as if nothing ever happened. So you finally build up the courage to talk to your father about it and your dad has this to say. Your brother may have made some bad decisions but his heart is in the right place. He's home now and has asked for forgiveness and I have granted it to him. The moral of the story is that you cannot earn God's grace, love and forgiveness. Jesus did that for us on the cross and when we get that forgiveness, it comes with the full package of benefits that everyone else gets no matter when you ask for it. Everyone wanders off at one time or another in their life, and God is there to save them. Isn't it great to know that you are always a child of God, and he will be waiting for you to return with open arms when you find your way home? Thank you. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the, God, the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, with all of your strength and with all of your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his robes and beat him half to death. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you have. Which of these do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Hello, my name is Raleigh Forrest, and I am the son of Tommy and Sheila Forrest. In today's society, there are many ways to achieve the title of Good Samaritan. The denotative definition of the term is someone who helps another at the cost of their own comfort. 
Anyone can do a good deed to a family or a friend or a family member, but can everyone help someone they are supposed to hate, like this one particular Good Samaritan? At this time, the last person a Jew would expect to help another Jew was a Samaritan. But the Samaritan had the choice, just like the previous Christians that just walked by. The Jew was badly beaten and in poor overall health. So the Samaritan could have easily overpowered the Jew and robbed him of the belongings he had left. The Samaritan also had the choice to help this poor man, regardless of his race or story, simply because it was the godly thing to do. I get to witness good acts every day. When I'm at school, I get to watch students help other students when they're in, in academic need and when they are getting bullied. I watch my father pick up the newspaper every morning for my elderly neighbor. I watch my mom take care of her four children with all of her heart and the household like it's her fifth child. I watch my brothers dedicate their time to teaching students at two local public schools. And I watch my sister love animals like they are herself. But unfortunately, there is evil in today's world too. Racism, sexism, and unfair judgment occur every day outside of the doors of the church. We as human beings decide to make decisions and assessments in everyday life to make our own selves more comfortable, almost completely disregarding others' comfort. But in our story, we have a choice. When we wake up in the morning, we can decide to be good. When we go throughout the day and interact with other people, we can decide to be good. And when we go to bed at night and pray to God, we can decide to be good. Jesus told the lawyer the story because Jesus wanted the lawyer and everyone else that might eventually hear this parable to remember that we have the choice to love and to help anyone that we can and aim to be more like the Good Samaritan. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servant. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had, had, what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Good morning. I'm Austin Branch, son of Steve and Linda Branch. Jesus used parables like this one, the parable of the un unforgiving servant, to teach us a life lesson. And uh, this one teaches about forgiveness. We all have a great debt due to God that none of us can repay. Yet Jesus paid that debt for us on the cross. So then if we accept his forgiveness for us, how can we not forgive others when they sin against us? Their debt to us is much less than our debt to God. We have all sinned against each other at some point, so we will all need forgiveness. We must remember what Jesus did for us and forgive others, not just once, not just seven times 70, but as many times as we need to because God will forgive us no matter what we do. Another important point is that 
is that what happens when we do not forgive others? Well, we not, might not be literally thrown into prison for not forgiving someone. Holding a grudge and retaliating against them will make you as guilty or even more guilty than the person who wronged you. Confucius once said, if you seek revenge, you better dig two graves. Forgiveness, forgive, forgiveness relieves the forgiver of the burden of hate. You know, if you cannot forgive, how can you expect to be forgiven? So, as we go out to church today, will we forgive others? Will forgiveness be part of our story? Or will our story look more like the parable of the unforgiving servant? Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all doing well this morning. I'm Rachel Rokiasami. My parents are Winston and Penny Rokiasami. I'd like to start this sermon with a question. No one has to raise their hand or answer out loud, so just answer this question to yourself. Do you think you are an important person? On the news one morning, they were talking about how seniors in high school view themselves in the 1960s. The same question I asked you was asked to them, and only 12% answered yes to that question. The same question was posed around 2013 to high school seniors, and astonishingly, 80% of them said yes. So what happened in those 53 years that made everyone feel so important? Well, maybe everyone just gained a bit of confidence or just became self-centered and entitled. There is no true answer to why there was such a peak, such a peak of self-importance. Self Self-importance obviously comes from within. There are many different ways of being important. There's self-importance, the importance of a parent to a child, the importance of an owner to a pet, the importance of someone to their partner, and the importance of you to the world, and so on. I believe, and I don't mean to offend anybody if they think differently, that in the grand scheme of the whole course of history, most people are not important. Of course, people like Abraham Lincoln, Albert Einstein, or Sandra Day O'Connor are important because of their contributions to the benefit of history. And there are some people that are important, like Adolf Hitler and Saddam Hussein, whose impacts were a lot more negative. Therefore, most people that are walking on the streets don't make a big enough impact on the world to make it in the history books. However, everyone is important in some way, shape, or form. I read this quote from an anonymous author that said, you are not here just to fill space or be a background character in someone else's movie. Consider this, nothing would be the same if you did not exist. Every place you have ever been and everyone you have ever spoken to would be different without you. We are all connected and we are all affected by the decisions and even the existence of those around us. I've always found that quote to be pretty comforting in the sense that if I had changed one thing about my day, someone else's life could have ended up a lot different. So in the small picture, our time on earth is valuable to the extent of our loved ones and strangers around us whose days we may have made. Also, you're important to yourself because without you, your body probably wouldn't be able to exist. Without you feeding yourself, exercise, and learning, and other growth-related activities, your body couldn't flourish and survive. With all this in mind, you are not more important to anyone than God. On any given day, at any given second, no matter how worthless you may feel, your life will always be important to God. Maybe that's why he has us live forever, huh? The best part about this parable is that the shepherd, God, rejoices when he gets his sheep back, us. In the story, the shepherd has 100 sheep, so even when he loses one, he still has 99 more, and that's a lot. So Still, he goes after this one because without it, he's missing a part of what he loves so dearly. He cannot complain or scold the sheep either. He's filled with joy. In reality, we obviously can't walk away from a physical God, but we can walk away from him spiritually. Some people stop going to church or stop praying, and some people even stop believing in him. 
Although God may not have to go out and search for you, he will be near you with his arms wide open to welcome you back. So it's up to us to come back to him. God is on an even bigger scale than the shepherd. There are about 7 billion people in the world compared to 100, and God still wants everyone. When even one of us is gone, he wants to bring you back, which makes you pretty important if you ask me. Even though God may have 6,999,999,999 people in his kingdom, he will seek you out and bring you in. Nothing could make you more important than that. Thank you all for giving me the time to preach to you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the service. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go to the, and work at my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long, nothing, doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work at, in my vineyard. When, when evening came, the owner in the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and go to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and received an denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble about the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for Daenerys? Take your pay and go. I want to give one who has hired last and the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want and with my own money? Or as you, Evius, became I am generous. So the last is first and the first is last. So good morning. So as all of you may know, if not, my name is Anthony Wall. I'm the son of Amy and Greg Gibson and the grandson of Phyllis and James Gibson. And this huge Sunday made me think a lot about our place in the world and why we're all here. And I can stand up here and preach for hours and hours and hours upon why all of our stories are unique and why we all have a place in the world. But... I like lunch, so let's get this going. The part of the parable that my brother Wyatt read a few moments ago that I thought about the most was the ending verse. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. But to fully understand this verse, we need to put the parable as a whole into context. So the daily lives of laborers were tough and required you to do many things that we wouldn't dream of having to do today. The physical labor was intense, and having to work from sun up to sundown was not fun, I can imagine. And the fact that they didn't know if they would have work the next day also played a part in their lives. While these laborers did get paid sufficiently, they were like us and felt the same emotions that we feel and express today because in a way they were like us. They're all people, they're all God's children. And towards the end of the parable, this is present from what the first set of workers say to the landowner and his foreman. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. 
The workers were envious of the ones that were hired last in the late afternoon. And they felt as though they'd been robbed of all the work they'd done. But don't we all feel robbed every now and again? We make an investment in something a day too late, and we're not able to reap the rewards as others may be able to. And that triggers a different kind of feeling. One that you get when you're robbed of something you've worked hard at, such as a group project that you did all the work at, work in at school or at work or in other places. And that's called jealousy. And that's one overwhelming emotion that the workers are feeling when they're paid the same wages than the workers that worked an hour's worth of work receive. And we all get jealous from time to time. I'm guilty of it. You're guilty of it. I'm sure some, we may have saints. It's okay. We all get jealous. And we think we, that we deserve more than we get. When the fact of the matter is that we don't deserve anything at all. It's especially true when it comes to the landowner and his workers, and even more so when talking about God and ourselves. The landowner gives each set of workers the same payment no matter how long they'd worked and how hard they'd been working. In the same way that God gives us all the same payment of eternal salvation when we are either saved when we're this tall and young or whenever we're this tall and we're getting old. I was born and dedicated to the church as a baby and made a decision to follow Christ at a young age, but this isn't what happens to all individuals. The Apostle Paul is a prime example of how someone can find God later in life, and it shows how through a confession of faith they can receive salvation and that God promises it to us all. Another example is how in Luke 23, 39 to 43, we are told the story of the thief on the cross, and it says, One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This story not only shows how much God's grace and mercy extend into all things we do, but in all things that we are going to do in the future and that we aspire to be in the life beyond. So, in the end, I want you to think about all that we've talked about about this parable. And whether or not in your day-to-day -day life you feel like the first set of workers who's worked hard, uh, or if you feel like you're part of the last set of workers who were hired last and thought there would be no work for them and that they would return home without anything but what they carried to the town square earlier that day. Those that were saved later than all the others by the grace of God and will receive the same payment, eternal salvation. There's still time for all of those out there to join the workers in the vineyard, to join a group of workers and to be promised the only thing that matters in life. The only thing that you'll care about when your duty as a Christian is over and whenever you have passed away from this world into the next. Whether or not you went to work out in the field and harvested God's crop by going out and bringing in the rejected and the non-believers, only then will you receive your payment, eternal salvation, and you will have your story remembered as one who did it for the kingdom of God and all who dwell within it, young and old. The field needs harvesting. Now go and join God's workers. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug deep down and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck the house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them to, into practice is like the man who built the house on a ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Good morning. My name is Jack Frederick, and I am the son of Dr. and Mrs. Jeff Frederick. I'm also the brother of Logan and Quentin Frederick and the proud owner of a furry little mutt named Buddy. I've come up here today to share my interpretation of the parable of the wise and foolish builder and why I chose it to be my story. It takes about eight months to build a house if you employ a contractor and on average 11 months if you build it yourself. 
In the United States, the average person lives in a house for seven years before reselling it, and although the prices of houses differ, we could all agree that our houses are priceless to us. Not because of the bricks, the, mor the blocks, and mortar and wood, but because of the precious things they protect, the people and even the furry little mutts named Buddy. This is why it is smart practice that if you're building a house, you make sure you're building on firm ground with a solid foundation to build on. Without a foundation built on secure ground, it is only a matter of time before all the time, the hard work, and money you spent to build your home goes to waste and the forces of Mother Nature annihilate your house. This also applies well if you relate houses and house building to our lives as Christians. If God is the firm foundation that we build on, our lives will be able to endure anything that we might have to deal with. And in the same way, if God is not a part of our foundation and we instead build on worldly things such as wealth, popularity, or material possessions, it's only a matter of time before our house falls to the ground, crushed under the hard times that everyone must face. Jesus doesn't promise that as his followers we won't see rain and storm. In fact, all our houses will face storms of varying sizes and intensities. Matthew 5.25 says, For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. We will see just as many cloudy days and hear just as much thunder as everyone else. But if we trust him and build our house on his foundation, he will take care of us. At the beginning of this year, in the first quarter of the second football game, I tore my ACL, meniscus, and LCL in my right knee while making a tackle. This meant that I would be sidelined for the rest of the season, forced to have reconstructive surgery, and that would end my senior season as a football player. I was crushed that senior year had to start this way. I missed almost all of the football season and much of baseball this spring, but with God's help and a lot of hard work, I was able to make it through and now have a healthy new knee. Sports have always been a huge part of my life, but I realize that the storm I faced this past year is trivial compared to the storms others of you have faced or are facing right now. In the grand scheme of my life, overcoming this storm of a torn up knee won't even matter. But I know that anything, big or small, will stand no chance with God helping us along. God sometimes moves storms out of our way, and other times he gives us the strength to stand up to them. In Psalm 46 it says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear that the mountains fall into the heart of the sea though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. God promises that if we build our houses on him, our true rock, that he will always give us the strength to make it through with our houses still intact. For each and every day of the past 17 years, I've been trying to build my life on my foundation, God. A lot of these years have been spent in this church and many of you have been there to assist me through youth, vacation Bible school, RAs, children's choir, and so many other activities. Next fall, as I go off to college at UNC Chapel Hill, I can't know what's in store for my life. What I do know is that for whatever might happen, I will be taken care of by God. Through the good, the bad, and the ugly, my house will remain firm on the rock, and I can do anything with him alongside of me. So this morning, please allow me to ask, what is your life built on? Do you feel secure because of your 401k? Your intellect, your health, or your young age, the storms of life can take all of these. Again he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all the garden plants, with such big branches and the bird, that the birds can perch in its shade. Hi. 
My name is Casey Williamson, and I'm the daughter of Theresa Williamson Thomas, and my dad's Barry Williamson. My stepdad is Bill Thomas, and um, having the faith of a mustard seed sounds easy enough, but as I've learned in my life, nothing worth having ever comes easy. The things we want in life, they all take hard work. A mustard seed relies fully on God. It has no knowledge of where it's going. It is completely 100% trusting in God in order to become the mustard plant it is intended to be. This tiny seed that grows into this remarkable plant is sort of like what God does in our lives. When we give ourselves to Him, we grow and change and become the person that God wants us to be. The person that we were destined to be is drastically different and remarkably greater than we ever could be without Him. When we become more and more Christ-like in our journey with Him, sharing His love for others. A church only needs one member to spread the word to thousands of people. Just like it takes one mustard seed to create a hundred more seeds through a plant. The mustard seed is only a metaphor, but it's a metaphor to show us that we as a person have an impact. There are billions of people in the world, and though at times we seem very small and unimportant in the midst of everything around us, one person, one individual can make a huge difference. It takes one spark to start a wildfire that burns acres and acres of trees. And it takes one light inside of us to create the same light in every single person that we meet. As an avid bubble bath enjoyer, I myself have learned that a little goes a long, long way. You truly only need a little bit, unless of course you're me at five years old trying to fill the entire bathroom with bubbles, which is fun until your mom crashes the party. Just like with bubbles, we only need the tiniest bit of faith in Jesus to show him for him to show us what he is truly capable of with our faith and with our lives. How life-changing it is, that true faith, the faith that the mustard seed has in him. We are made in the eyes of God, and he has a fully formed plan for each of us before we are even born. Just like he does with the mustard seed, he knows where we're going and he knows what we're doing. We have to be fully confident in God and his plan for us in order to fulfill what our life is meant to be. Because with God, wealth, nor education, nor weight, nor your status in this world matter. Everything is possible with him and he can use everyone. Mary was poor and unwedded, yet he chose her to have his son, a son that saved all of us, a son that came to this earth and gave his life for us. God makes disciples out of anyone who is willing to be one. He takes the seed and he makes the plant. Our story begins when we let God take over, and it's an amazing story that he has planned out for us, as long as we have the faith of a mustard seed. Again, it would be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and instructed them well unto them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two, and another one bag, each according to his ability, and then he went on his journey. The man who received five bags of gold went, and once he put his money into work, he gained five more bags of gold. Soon also, the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who received one bag of gold went and dug into a hole into the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the servant who, ser who those servant returned and settled accounts with them. The man who received five bags of gold brought another five. Master, he said, you instructed me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in being few things. You put, I will put you in charge of many things. Come share your happy, master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you instructed me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. 
Then the man who received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have seen no sorn and gathering where you have not scattered the seeds. So I, as I was afraid, I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you have no the harvest where I have and not sworn and gathered where I had scattered the seeds. Well, then you should have put my money in deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have returned the, re received back with interest. So take the bags of gold from him and give it to one who has ten bags. For whosoever has will be given more and will be ab have abundance. Whosoever does not have, even that they will be taken from them and thrown into the worthless servant outside into the darkness where they will be weeping and gashing of teeth. Good morning. My name is Megan Elks. My parents are David and Sandra Elks and my story is the parable of the talents. First off, what exactly is a talent? The monetary perspective of a talent regards it as a piece of gold with an assumed weight between 75 and 100 pounds. When you construct the math converting troy ounces to pounds, then multiply the average weight of a talent by the number of talents given to each worker, the master essentially gives the first, second, and third servants $3 million, $1 million, and $600,000 respectively. But any way you calculate it, it's a lot of money. Why not average the talents available and gift each servant with an equal amount? When you step back from the mathematics, verse 21 remains, reading, His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, and I will give you much. Enter into the joy of your master. The emphasis in the parable is not on the number of talents given. The number of talents given is but a minor detail used as an identifier for the nameless servants. This verse, however, is written multiple times, appearing again in verse 23, disregarding the talents, but offering a thank you and I am pleased from the master. Although every entrustment was different, the two that were productive each underwent the same percent increase and the same positive regard from their master. Take, for example, members of the Friends of Jesus Sunday School class. Although the members are handicapped by average standards, their potential for love and compassion is greater than many others. God is not enacting a punishment by giving what we perceive as less, but differentiating various possibilities to let talent shine through. Then there's the problem child, also known as the servant who accepted a gift with no additional return. Imagine you gave me a potted seed. I could keep it safe, confirm no harm comes to it, and examine it every day. But when you return a month later to find it in the same state, you probably would be displeased. You might not exclaim, you wicked and slothful servant, like the master in the parable. But if I said, I was scared to mess it up, or I'm returning it in its original condition, you couldn't validate either excuse. So when the last servant returns his single talent with these justifications, the master is obviously upset. However, the master's grievance was not that there was no interest rate, but rather there was no effort. So how are the talent talents relevant to our lives? Well, like many parables, there are multiple interpretations. <coughs> the first is from the monetary stance. <clears throat> Claiming those who risk their money given from God will see their donations flourish in and outside of the church. Our wallets get a bit frightful in our back pockets once we hear the sermon, usually conveniently placed at the close of the church year. Taking the thing that, when given enough of, provides us endless concrete material possessions invest, and investing into what we may be unsure of ensues worry for everyone. Some even believe the servant gifted one talent withheld to avoid corruption, but we can see his failure to risk his gift was wrong. The doubling results are what inspire us to push forward with new ideas to spread our faith, even in times of uncertainty. The second interpretation is that each talent represents the gifts of the gospel that we are inclined to share. The one who sits on his gift and does nothing to grow the kingdom of God is reprimanded. And as Christians, one of the most important messages we hear is the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
And just as the parable of the talents is placed in the middle of narratives regarding the ends of times, it may even suggest using our talents to glorify and spread God's word is our most important purpose. The gift of Christ is not ours to withhold to ourselves. We do not decide who is worthy. We are responsible for sharing it with anyone who will listen. The last is the English interpretation of the word talent, which derived from this parable. What we excel at doing. What we love doing. We as a church form together with our strengths to build the body of Christ. More importantly, we must acknowledge that we were not all given the same talents. While public speaking and musical abilities are often perceived as the definition of talent within a church, there are many who can be just as influential in other ways. Whether it's bringing the mystery casserole to the potluck lunch, welcoming the frightened couple in the back pew, or having the capacity to lead the carpool for Sunday school, everyone has at least one school skill. God has blessed us all. I challenge you to discover your talent and act upon it and build upon it to serve the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for giving us stories. Thank you for welcoming us home no matter what the circumstance, showing us kindness in unexpected places, and forgiving us even when we haven't earned it, for rescuing us when we wander away, loving us all equally, and being our firm foundation. And thank you for providing us the opportunity and skills to grow. We pray that we find the strength to share not only our stories, but yours. Amen. Will you please stand with me as we sing I Love to Tell a Story on page 560.
Let me ask that you be seated for just a moment. I think the word of the day not only is story, but the word for us as the family of faith of these young people is pride. Aren't we proud of these young people? I think they deserve a round of applause. <clears throat> Seniors, preachers, you all did a fantastic job. Thank you so much for what you are doing, and I wish you well as you get ready to go off in college and everything. I, I don't want you all around here because you're going to make folks think that um, you know, I can be replaced, and I don't want that to, to happen. But thank you so much for your faithfulness and your devotion to, to this week and your preparation and um, to Doug as well for all that you do. Seniors, I think um, you owe me something. And um, could I have the keys to the church back, please? Go ahead. Okay. Oh. You haven't lost the keys to the church, have you? I just want to know, where did that come from? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, so after many youth lock-ins and many sardines, we finally found the door that the key goes to. And we, we were very proud of ourselves, so we wanted to share it with all of you, and we thought we'd decorate it for you. That is great. They got you this time, I think, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> Um, Doug, would you recognize all the officers? And sure. Y'all never cease to amaze. I, I, I did not see this coming at all. <laughs> Usually I overhear something, but not this year. Um, would all of the Youth Week officers that have been involved in either service please come forward? Stand kind of sort of in the background of the seniors. <laughs> There's several in the balcony making their way down. Um, and before I share anything else about them or process or anything like that, um, would everyone here who is either during their time in youth here um, been a Youth Week officer or a, had a part in a youth Sunday service um, in their life uh, here at this church? Would you please stand um, so they can see they're not alone? Thank you, thank you. Varying ages. Um, so it's a long time tradition. Um, the youth standing before you here have met since late February, uh, planned scripture, the theme, the stories. Uh, the, the seniors chose to preach on parables because Jesus taught in stories. And um, just really grateful for everything they, they've done. Um, now, uh, I'm going to call on Bill Davis to do the benediction. And after Bill finishes with the benediction, please remain seated, and Megan Elks is going to give us our post lead. May the, Lord, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other, and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May you strengthen your hearts so that you will be, bl be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. <laughs> 